Tonight, another hit to your pocketbook as Sask power rates are set to increase and Sask Energy is looking for an increase as well. Also, money is on the minds of the Premier's meeting today in Victoria, their first in-person Council of the Federation meeting since the pandemic. Plus, the end of an era for a place known as Leisureland near Saskatoon. This is CBC Saskatchewan News. It is Monday, July 11th, and the CBC Saskatchewan News starts right now. Good evening and thank you for watching. We begin tonight with a tragic ending to a story we've been following since April. A five-year-old boy who disappeared on a First Nation east of Nipawin in the spring has been found dead. Frank Young was last seen playing outside his home. Members of the RCMP and people in the community launched a widespread search effort. Red Earth Cree Nation Chief Fabian Head says the boy's remains were found in the water at Red Earth. Police do not suspect foul play. Young's family will hold a news conference along with the RCMP and FSIN tomorrow afternoon in Prince Albert. RCMP say the fatal shooting and search for a suspect in Langham last Friday is a homicide-suicide investigation. They say the coroner has now confirmed the man found in a burned home that day is the shooting suspect Justin Heimbecker and that it was Heimbecker's home that was on fire that day. They are not sharing the name of the 48-year-old man they believe Heimbecker killed that day. RCMP say there are no other suspects in the case and that Heimbecker and the other man did know each other but were not related. Police say it all started with a call about someone uttering threats followed by a report of a fatal shooting in Langham. They arrived to find the dead man outside of a home there and the house fire on the same street. They issued emergency alerts while they searched for the suspect, then called them off after the body was found in Heimbecker's home. Homeowners in our province will be paying more for power in the coming months, and energy bills could be going up too. Today, the Saskatchewan Rate Review Panel gave the green light to Sask Power's proposed 4% rate increase starting September 1st. Another 4% rate increase kicks in April 1st next year. Cabinet will have the final say. At the same time, Sask Energy has filed a combined one-year commodity and three-year delivery service rate proposal. What does that mean for your wallet? Well, if approved, residential customers will pay on average about $12 more per month in the first year, then around $2.50 more per month in year two, and then an additional $2.50 more a month in year three. The NDP's critic for Sask Power is not impressed. Absolutely. Crown corporations are jewels in Saskatchewan. They're incredibly well managed. They're well run organizations. They exist to provide reliable, stable and affordable services to Saskatchewan people. You have a government right now that is flush with cash. Their taxation revenue is through the roof. And instead of using Crown corporations to help offset the crushing cost of living, they're turning around with everything in their control and increasing rates and increasing costs to households and small businesses. It's truly mind boggling. This wasn't what I thought I was doing when I got up this morning and came to the ledge. It's, uh, it's pretty surprising. Not everyone is surprised though, given the price increases on so many other things. We hit the streets in Regina to find out how you feel about it. Oh yeah, yeah, paid an extra $12, sure. You're paying one, a certain amount and $12 is not going to make that much difference. At the world stage right now, like everything is going up and that's not going to be easier. But is that necessarily like, should that be on us or should that be on someone else? It's way too much. Everything's you? increasing. Unfortunately, I work in the city of Regina and yeah, everything's increasing. So yeah, I'm not happy. <laughs> not, but I mean, uh, at the same time, we we need power and, and if costs are going up, costs are going up. Sask Energy says if approved, this would be just its second commodity rate increase since 2014. The last change was in April of 2019. If it's approved, increases start August 1st. The second increase would take effect June 1st of next year. The third, June 1st of 2024. 
Money is on the minds of the premiers who have gathered today in the B.C. capital. It's the first time they've held their Council of the Federation in person in three years. They're calling on the federal government to increase health care transfer payments, and they want to meet with the Prime Minister. As soon as possible. As soon as possible. It's, it's overdue, and so we need to make sure this happens. This is larger than politics. This is you know, about ensuring a, a sustainable health care system, not just today, but into the decades ahead. I believe the Prime Minister understands the urgency of it, but my message to everybody out there is the patient in the gurney, and when you're standing at the end, don't care who pays for it. They just want Canadian-level care. The Premier's day included a meeting with Indigenous leaders who pushed for full inclusion in the Council of the Federation. The Premier's also heard a call for a meeting focused on the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Ottawa is spending $10 million on renewable energy projects in Saskatchewan Indigenous communities. The Federal Minister of Natural Resources, Jonathan Wilkinson, was in Regina today for the announcement. The funding is split up over five different investments, and more than $4 million of it is going to the Meadow Lake Tribal Council for energy efficiency and conservation related to businesses it runs. The chief of the Meadow Lake Tribal Council says it's a moment of pride for them. Many years, you know, in the past, we never had a really a good chance to be a part of the economy, especially something so dear to our heart as, uh, you know, protecting Mother Earth, as you know, as our, our ancestors, our, our elders, they tell us, you know, to continue to take care of Mother Earth and they'll take care of you. And this is a big part of it. They can help us to accelerate the work that needs to be done, but they can also benefit in a way where, you know, traditionally they have not benefited from a lot of the kinds of developments that we have, uh, we have undertaken. And it's time from a social justice perspective, but it's also just time from an economic reconciliation perspective for that change. Meadow Lake Tribal Council is also receiving money for an 816-kilowatt solar farm in southern Saskatchewan. That project will be 100% owned by nine First Nations of the Meadow Lake Tribal Council and located on Indigenous-owned land. More than 100 Canadian organizations that privately sponsor refugees are accusing Ottawa of breaching their agreement. Usually by this time of year, the federal government has told them how many refugees they're allotted. And those applications are submitted. But as Bonnie Allen reports, that hasn't happened. Yeah, I don't know. I didn't think, I, I didn't get, the, you know, like the, how I should tell them yet. Doha Karsa is almost at a loss for words. She's just learned her application to privately sponsor her brother, his wife and their daughter as refugees in Canada hasn't even been submitted to Ottawa yet. They're Syrian refugees, and for five years, the parents have been separated from their young son, Adnan, who's already in Saskatoon. I don't understand why. Because money is there, applications are ready to go. So what, why is the delay? Karsa is submitting the applications through the Mennonite Central Committee with the help of resettlement coordinator Mark Bigland Pritchard. But for now, Ottawa isn't even accepting their applications. The longer they have to wait, the harder their life is. The Mennonite Central Committee is one of more than 100 sponsorship agreement holders in Canada. Those are organizations, often religious groups, community organizations, humanitarian agencies that actually have a deal with the federal government to privately sponsor refugees and take full responsibility to settle them here. And each year they collectively sponsor about 10 to 12,000 refugees. But so far this year, the federal government has only allowed each group to sponsor 25 refugees. We typically have an allocation across the whole country of 400. We were allowed to put in for 25 people at the beginning of April. And that was it until, you know, we get the allocation sorted. The National Association of Sponsorship Agreement Holders sent a letter to Immigration and Refugees Minister Sean Fraser accusing Ottawa of breaching their agreements. A spokesperson for the minister told CBC News they are working to address the issue, but did not provide an explanation for the delay. And they are missing all the, these moments with him. Once their applications are accepted, Cars has been told they could take two to three years to process. Bonnie Allen, CBC News, Meadow Lake, Saskatchewan. It is the end of an era for a place known as Leisureland. 
People living in a tiny trailer park community near Saskatoon are packing up. They're dissolving their decades-old housing cooperative because their lease agreement with Miwasan Valley Authority is expiring. Kendall Latimer has more. It's like a, a hidden gem, a little sanctuary on the outskirts, outskirts of Saskatoon. Jackie Jensen's home is hidden in the trees, just steps from the river. She's lived here in this trailer park community for nine years. We're living in a small cooperative that is basically self-sufficient run as a tiny community. People have actually been living here for decades. Back in the 60s, the area was turned into an amusement park. The Ferris wheel is long gone, but the mini train tracks stuck around, and so did members of the permanent community that started to form. In 1997, the land changed hands. The Miwasan Valley Authority has purchased leisure land formerly known as Maple Grove. The land runs along the South Saskatchewan River and the authority says it will take several years to develop a plan for the site. A small mobile home community will remain. But the small community will no longer remain. The sale agreement was a 25-year lease between Miwasan and the community. It expires this year. Residents had hoped Miwasan would have a change of heart. Sheldon Fisher tried to negotiate. Maybe to extend it for, you know, a year, five years, ten years, or anything really. But Miwasan wouldn't budge, leaving residents devastated. The quality of living here um, is unparalleled, uh, really. Uh, we're very fortunate. It's, it's, uh, it's heartbreaking, and it makes me cry to even talk about it. Jackie and Sheldon worry for the other trailer owners who have called Leisureland home for decades. My mom's next door and she's been here for 18, 18 plus years. And Anne has been here for over 25 years, my other neighbor on the other side. So for them, it's pretty, pretty emotional for them. There'll never be anything like this. I've always lived, but always wanted to live by the water. Here I was, and now I gotta leave it. That's the sad part. Once the people leave, Miwasan says the land will stay in a predominantly natural state for now, with potential opportunity for low impact passive recreation. They'll assess the environment and create a site resource management plan before doing anything more. For now, people are hauling out structures and belongings accumulated over decades. They're selling their trailers if they can and tearing down what they can't get rid of. We are all now in the process of trying to relocate and um, uh, dissolve everything here. And the last people left are getting ready to say goodbye to each other and to leisure land. I'm trying to be positive. I'm trying to be positive and be grateful that we had the opportunity. Most people don't even know this place exists, right? This is, this is such a sanctuary. Kendall Latimer, CBC News, Saskatoon. Well, it was a sunny day in Saskatoon today, but oh, that wind did blow. Nothing compared to the weather they saw over the weekend, though. When we come back, Ethan will have a recap of what happened and, of course, your forecast for what's to come. Stay with us. This weather update is brought to you by Capital GMC Buick Cadillac. The exclusive export event is back. And CBC weather specialist Ethan Williams joins me now. It seems the severe weather is it's relentless it's just not stopping yeah it, that's right sam it's uh been uh from tornadoes to rain to hail we've uh, pretty much seen it all these uh, past few days and uh, take a look at this this was on saturday morning in the north end of saskatoon marble sized hail falling along with very heavy rain saskatoon's airport actually recording a wind gust of 96 kilometers an hour during this event and as a result, some damage was reported to vehicles in this part of town as well, and uh, also out near Martinsville, too. And this is the aftermath out in the parking lot at Costco in uh, Saskatoon's north end. And this was a parking lot in the same area. And other parts of the province also saw severe storms over the weekend on both Saturday and on Sunday as well. 
And it was a pretty stormy Friday, too, the day before that. In fact, we now have four tornadoes confirmed by Environment Canada. Three were at Painton, or just near the community on the uh, number 16 highway, just north of there. And then one at Blaine Lake, uh, which was uh, which happened a part, as part of a separate cell just a little bit later. Now, all these have been preliminary, uh, per, preliminarily rated. That's a long word. Uh, they've been given an EF0 rating as of right now. But there was some damage at a farm near Blaine Lake. And so it's possible that that rating could be upgraded. Now we go from the storms into the heat western side of the province under excessive heat warnings. Now for probably the next couple of days as temperatures get into the low 30s with humidex values into the mid 30s. Saskatoon is a part of that uh, as well. And it's all because of this jet stream and this ridge that is now building over Alberta and parts of our province. And that shifts eastward over the next couple of days. You can see this heat really building into south and central here. And that jet stream spikes way up as we go in uh, into Wednesday. And uh, uh, our humidex levels also going to be increasing as well, especially tomorrow afternoon. We're looking at uh, low to mid 30 humidex levels along that western side of the province. Maybe a little uh, bit less heat as we head our way east, but it will still be uh, quite uncomfortable for some of us. But for right now, we're sitting at mostly comfortable temperatures. The last of the comfortable temperatures we'll probably see for a couple of days. South and central generally sitting in the mid 20s. Uh, Regina at 26, Saskatoon 24. Hotspot is leader where they're still at 27. And and wind gusts, as we mentioned earlier, quite breezy in Saskatoon today. Gusts still close to 50 kilometers an hour at this point. Those will start to die down as we go through the overnight hours. Showers and thunderstorms possible in east central Saskatchewan and the Churchill region tonight. But again, I think those will be mostly benign, no severe storms. High pressure builds in tomorrow. That clears us out calms us down in terms of winds. Could see some showers in the north, but our next chance for severe weather moves in on Wednesday as this low pressure system and an associated cold front starts to interact with the moisture and all that humidity in the atmosphere. And that starts to make its way out of the province as we get into early Thursday morning. I think best chance for severe weather will be later in the day on Wednesday. Wind gusts will be not too bad tomorrow, but they will pick up as we head into Wednesday with that system moving in. Those gradient winds coming in up to 50 kilometers an hour will likely uh, help produce that storm activity into the evening. Our next seven days in Regina, yeah, it looks hot. Uh, temperatures into the low 30s. Look at those Humidex levels. And keep in mind, those overnight lows are really not going to get much below 20 degrees and uh, not a whole lot of moisture on the way either. So if you're a farmer or if you're uh, planting the garden and uh, or if you've got the garden planted, keep that in mind. And uh, Sam, I'm thinking uh, shade, uh, a hat, uh, lots of uh, sunscreen wherever you are going tomorrow. It's going to be really important over these next few days because you're going to want to stay safe uh, during these, uh, this prolonged heat event. You know why it's going to be super hot on the weekend? Why is that? Country Thunder starts this weekend. Of course, right, right on time. Right on time. <laughs> As always. Thanks, Ethan. You bet. Well, he's just over a month old and already something of a social media sensation. Simba the goat has a very distinct look about him with ears that are 56 centimeters long. That's about 22 inches and still growing. The kid now has a special velvet pouch so that he can run without tripping over his ears. We'll be back after the break. Ottawa is demanding immediate action from the heads of the telecom companies after a major outage that affected the Rogers network last week. The federal industry minister says he wants the companies to have formal plans ready within 60 days from today. The telecom providers are being asked to come up with an agreement for mutual assistance during outages. They're also being asked to have a plan for better ways to inform the public and authorities during telecommunications emergencies and reach a deal on emergency roaming. The CRTC will investigate the outage on Friday. Millions of Canadians were affected when Rogers service went down and now at least one class action lawsuit has been filed for those inconvenienced by the outage. Rogers says the system for wireless and internet services is fully functional again for the majority of customers. Now, that outage on Friday caused a range of problems for people, including those who needed emergency services. Ethel Musa has a story of what happened to one woman in southwestern Ontario. Shane Eby says his father Greg and Aunt Linda were running errands on Friday in downtown Hamilton when his aunt began to feel unwell. 
He said it didn't take long for his father to realize something was very wrong. My father went back into the bank and asked the security guard for help. And then the security guard came out to help, but both the security guard and my father realized they needed more help. Shane Eby says his father asked people in the bank's parking lot to call 911 for him, but they couldn't connect. So he started approaching people on the street, but their cell phones didn't work either. She was in distress. Um, and he had to keep leaving her to try to get help. And uh, it took some time. Uh, and he wasn't able to actually connect with anyone who had a functioning cell phone. Evie says his aunt was eventually taken to hospital by emergency services, but precious time was wasted trying to contact them. She later died in hospital from a brain aneurysm. Having a connection keeps people alive. And I, I imagine a lot of people are questioning whether that's actually available right now and how safe they might be. According to Rogers' terms of service, access to 911 may not function correctly or at all in the event of a network outage or power failure. And while there is a way to get around that on cell phones, not everyone knows it. Removing your SIM card, um, you're no longer a subscriber of any network. You don't have a phone number or anything. Like that. Let, still lets you uh, dial 911 anywhere. Shane Eby says that's critical information other Canadians should know in case of an emergency. That might be just a good public service announcement that the uh, telecom can share. Idil Musa, CBC News, Hamilton. And Ethan is back with one last look at tonight's weather. And it's looking like a pretty calm and nice night in uh, Regina, Sam. By the time we get to 8 a.m. tomorrow morning, we'll already be at 18 degrees. Uh, nice light winds and sunny conditions. We get to the noon hour and we'll be at 26. And keep in mind that UV index tomorrow you are going to want to need uh, or have some sunscreen with you. It's going to be quite high. Saskatoon will be at 17 by tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Nice light gusts out of the southwest. And keep in mind we'll be at 27 by noon, but that humidity will be increasing increasing into uh, the low to mid 20s and this weekend was great for getting out and to the lake and that is exactly what Monty did he took this photo at McKay Lake beautiful conditions there he says and uh, the lake looks uh, just like glass Sam beautiful calm weekend out there you can't even tell if that photo's right side up yeah that's right <laughs> thanks Ethan you bet and that is it for us tonight for news anytime you can always head to our website or Subscribe to the CBC Saskatchewan YouTube channel. Glenn Reed will be back with more local news at 11. We are back tomorrow at 6. Thank you for watching and have a great evening.